didn't put that up there, but hey. So hey, we're gonna we're talking about women today, mothers and 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 all. And I see people fanning. If you ushers, if they get warm, turn the air on for them. Uh, I've been sweating since I walked in, so that's all right. Amen. But uh, we're talking about women. How Jesus? How did Jesus handle women? How did he talk to women? How, what about regarding women? We're going to look at some things. We've got eight points today, and I've asked different men in the church to get up and talk about these points. So I'm going to do the first one, and I've got to do a couple more because somebody had to work, but uh, it's all right. So uh, Jesus is our example in every way in life. He's our example of how we should live as a Christian, but how did he treat women? And today we're going to look at the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, details of how Jesus treated women, how he handled them, and, and we read through it, and we don't recognize certain things, and we're going to look at different parts of the stories and that you, you maybe have not ever noticed. So number one, Jesus empowered women. Jesus empowered women. You know, he talks about empowering men are the sons of God, but when it talks about sons of God, it's talking about women too, and we look over that. But let me explain. In Luke 8, 1 through 3, it tells the story that after Jesus began a ministry throughout the country, visiting cities and villages, and he announced the news of the kingdom of God, he had 12 disciples that traveled with him. How many know he started with 12? How many know he ended up with over 60? And how many know there was a bunch of women in the bunch? Now, a lot of people didn't recognize that. They just know, uh, you know, the 12. But in, in, in verse 2, it says, as did a number of women walk with him. And he healed many illnesses, set free pre, uh, from demonic power. One of the women was Mary, who was from the village of Magdala, Mary Magdalene. And, and among the women was Susanna, verse 3. You got Mary, Susanna, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who managed King Herod's household. And many other women. Say many other women. Well, well, they supported Jesus' ministry through their own personal finances. What? Women had money? What? Women had money in Jesus' day. I'm just going to let that sit there because we just don't think about, you know, they were in the background. No, they weren't. Why is this important? To travel with a rabbi. And everybody called Jesus teacher. They called him rabbi. To travel with a rabbi was a great, great honor. And these ladies were allowed to travel with him, talk to him, ask questions of him. That's pretty cool. Amen, amen? So come on. Cody, where are you hiding at? <laughs> and who's after Cody? Get ready. Get ready, but sit still because I have 45 minutes worth of notes. On this one little card, like I used to practice for my tests with. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, pastor asked me to talk today on, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you point two so you can be writing it in your notes. Uh, we're going to talk, talk about Jesus taught women, um, which can sound a little odd if you're just, well, okay, Jesus taught women, big deal, cool. Um, but it wasn't customary to teach women in that time. Women were, like Pastor was saying, women were kind of devalued in a lot of areas in culture, uh, which is not right, but that's just how it was. Um, I'm not going to read this story, but I encourage you to go to uh, the book of John chapter 4. This is the, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize this in the, the CDV, the Cody, well, that wouldn't be CDV, CCV, Cody condensed version. I'm going to give you that version today. Uh, but Jesus meets a woman at the well. Most of you have heard this story, the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus is on his way through Samaria. He stops at the well. The disciples are like, man, we're starved. I'm so hungry. There's not a McDonald's anywhere around. I don't see a Burger King. I need a Whopper. So they all go into town, and Jesus is like, nah, I'll stay here near the well, and y'all go into town. And I think it was because Jesus knew this woman was coming, and he was like, this is why I actually stopped here. Y'all go ahead. I need to do, take care of something. Um, so he stops at the well, and this woman comes in the middle of the day with no other women, which if you look back at the culture of that time, it was very unusual for women to go to the well by themselves. Usually the well time was like earlier in the morning. It wasn't too hot. They had to walk for miles with those, you know, you've seen the videos with those like big long, they were beastie. These, weren't, these were like Amazon women. They were like, I've got this water. You husbands go work. I'm going to bring all your water. Have y'all ever carried buckets of water like that? It, it, y'all, it looks like it's easy because they're just like, you know, I got it. And they got it on their back. It's not easy. Let me tell you that. It's not easy carrying those, especially from like 
here to McDonald's? No, I don't want to do that. But these women would do that in the morning. They would come. They would get water from the well. They would gossip and talk about people. And that was like the social time of the day. So the fact that this woman was coming in the middle of the day already says something about who she was uh, and that Jesus would make an intentional moment to stop and be there for her and teach her in this moment. But the story goes, she comes to the well. She's drawing water out of the well. Jesus is there. He speaks to her. And she's really surprised that he speaks to her because she's a Samaritan woman and Jesus is a Jew and Jewish men, Jewish people traditionally look down upon Samaritan people. They're, they're like the scum of the earth. We don't talk to Samaritan people. They're all sinners and God hates them. But Jesus knew that wasn't the truth. God doesn't hate them and they're not the scum of the earth. So he, not only is he talking to a woman, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. But not only is he talking to a Samaritan woman, he's talking to a Samaritan woman who's at the well in the middle of the day with no one around her because she's been shunned from her family. And Jesus starts to read her mail. And she's like, you know, do you, why are you here? And he's like, she's like, do you need water? And he's like, if you knew the kind of water I had, you would ask me for a drink of water because I have living water that you will never thirst again. And of course, I mean, now we know what that means. But if you were back in the time of Jesus, you'd be like, what is he talking about? Like, I want, and that's what she said. She's like, well, I want some of that living water so that I don't have to walk back and forth to this well every day. That would be great. And he knew he was talking about spiritual water, being spiritually satisfied by him and what he's bringing to the earth. So he's talking with this woman at the well. But I think the significance of this point is that he took time to teach not only a woman, but a Samaritan woman who, if you continue in the story, she was shunned from even her own people because she'd had five husbands and the man she was living with wasn't even her husband. So not only was she a woman and not only was she a Samaritan, she was even rejected from that group of people because she was so far lost in their eyes that she wasn't, they would be unclean to be around her. That's why she couldn't go to the well with them because if they were to walk with her, they would be sinful because she's sinful. So I I just want to point that out this morning that Jesus saw the value and wanted to honor this woman to, to teach us and to illustrate that He is here for every single brokenhearted person. He is here, and this is for you men. This is not just for the women in the room. Maybe you feel like that woman that feels far away, and like, I don't even, I don't even feel like God, I don't even feel like I deserve for God to even look my way, because that's how she felt, but God purposefully stopped in the middle of the day to speak with her and teach her in that moment, because that's who he was revealing God to be, the God close to the brokenhearted, the God that's close to those who are far away from even their own people. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen? So Jesus taught people because he honored, well, Jesus taught women because he honored them far above what uh, society would honor them. I don't even know who's next, but I'm going to pass it off to somebody. Mr. Clayton's coming. Y'all get ready. He has more notes than I do. (laughs) All right. I don't know whether we have the capability. I guess we do. Uh, If you can put up John, uh, Luke, I mean, chapter 10, 38 to 42. If not, I'll just read it. But uh, fill in the blank. Jesus honored women. I think Cody already alluded to that. He honored women. Here's a story that uh, Jesus was out ministering. He had been out sending out disciples, doing all kinds of work was there. And people don't often think about the fact that uh, the caregiver needs some care given from time to time. And here Jesus comes to Bethany little town a couple of miles from Jerusalem on his walk, on his journey. And uh, he came to, uh, to Martha's house. He honored her and came into his home. Look, let me read it to you. Now, while they were on their way, Jesus entered the village called Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who was seated herself at the Lord's feet and was continually listening to his teaching. But Martha was very busy and distracted with all her serving responsibilities. And she approached him and said, Lord, is it of no concern to you that my sister left to me to do serving alone? Tell her to help me and tell her to do her part. But the Lord replied, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which is to her advantage, which will not be taken away from her. Now, Mary, or Martha gets a bad rap sometimes. Uh, I've heard people say, well, she was so religious and she was so preoccupied and she was all these other kind of things, and Mary was doing the, the, the worshiping. But let me tell you something. Between Martha's kitchen and Mary's altar was Jesus. He came to her home, and it says her home. You could have said 
Lazarus' home, but it wasn't Lazarus' home. Could have said Mary's home, but it wasn't Mary's home. He came to Martha's home. Again, another reference to the fact that uh, that women had power. Women had things going on, and Jesus knew it and honored it. Uh, He loved that thing. I I don't know about you, but I, I love to go to places where those servant hearts are, you know? You walk in there, and the first thing they'll say is, now, I didn't have time to clean up. You ever been there? And you look around, and you think, well, unless we're doing surgery, it looks pretty good to me. I mean, are we doing an appendectomy, or did I come to eat dinner? And, and, then they, and then they say the next thing I love to hear. Well, I just threw something together. I hope you like it. Woo, let me tell you something. Last night, the whole roof gang was meeting, and we didn't have a place, and Della volunteered because she has that uh, gift of servanthood and that, uh, that love language of, her, of servanthood. And we went to her house, and I knew we were going, and we were having beans and cornbread, and I love beans and cornbread. Throw some onions in, all that good stuff. And she was going to have potato salad, and I said, boy, I was looking forward to fried potatoes and onions. You know what we had last night, Pastor? Fried potatoes and onions along with that bean soup and the things. I don't know about you, but I like a person with a servant's heart. Amen? Amen. And, and Jesus being tired, Jesus needing to be refreshed, Jesus needing to have care given, the greatest caregiver of all. But he had a real mortal body. He understood what it was to be tired. He understood what it was to be hungry. And he came to Martha's house because he knew. He knew. Martha had a servant's heart. Oh, thank God for the servanthood that was there. Jesus never made a comparison. Jesus never said, Martha, you're too busy, until she came to talk about her sister's problem. Then he addressed it. And even then, he never scolded. He never said that one was better than the other. My friend, we don't have to compare ourselves with someone else. We only need to be doing what God calls us to do. God doesn't measure me by Pastor Brett, and oh, how glad I am, because I think we have a wonderful pastor. He didn't pay me to say that, I want you to know. But oh, how gracious and how, how wonderful it is to be in this church and to have this kind of preaching and this kind of teaching and this kind of love. But it's not just him. He can't do it alone. I, I find great love and great servanthood and, and great compassion Every time I come into this place, because of so many people in here that have that gift. So he came to Martha's house. But let me, let me, let me finish with one word I want. Did we get that? No, we didn't get it up there. Okay, I'll read it to you. Now, while they were on their way, Jesus entered into a village called Bethany. And the woman named Martha welcomed him. You know what I found out? Anywhere that Jesus is welcomed, he goes. He goes. He goes. Praise God. He loves us enough that when we welcome him, he's standing at the door ready to come in. Praise God. Praise God. He honored women. All right. All All right. right. Who's next? Brad. And that Brad didn't even bring any notes. Look out, man. <laughs> so part four, Jesus, take this in your notes, Jesus confided in women. And so we read the story in the book of John where Jesus had been laying in the tomb and it was on the third day and Mary Magdalene that morning, she goes to pay her respects and she walks up and she realizes that the tomb has been rolled away. And she was shocked. She was scared. She had all these emotions going on. She immediately runs back to tell two of the disciples, Peter and John. And then John records this. It said that they took off running. One outrun the other and said they made it to the tomb. And when they got there, the two men went inside. And Mary stood outside peering in. And it said when they went in, They looked, and there was cloth laying there. The linen was laying around, but Jesus was not there. And it said that they ran back out, 
and they left because they were confused. They were in shock. They thought that Jesus had told them that he would be resurrected and live, and they couldn't understand it. They were very confused. And Mary Magdalene stayed there. She stayed and wept, and as tears came down her eyes, she peered in to the tomb. And when she did, she saw two angels standing there. And the angels looked at her and said, Woman, why are you weeping? Now let me interject something here. If you've been married long enough, you don't ever look at your wife and say, Woman. You don't ever do that. And I'm sure this was probably the first recorded account, if the angels were male, we don't know, but if they were, that that actually happened. It was probably the last recorded account that that actually happens. So he looks at her and says, woman, why are you weeping? She said, where is my Lord? Show me. Where have they taken me? Well, she steps back out and she notices, it's still dark that morning, she notices this image, this person coming towards her, and she thinks it's a gardener. And she looks at the gardener and she says, Where have they taken my Lord's body? Where have they taken Jesus' body? Second recorded account, he says, woman. (laughs) And only Jesus can get away with that. But again, he didn't say it in a demanding way. He said it because he knew he had her attention. And she looks at him and she says, Rabboni, which means teacher. She recognized him. He says, why do you stand here weeping? Go and tell the brothers that I am alive, that I have risen. Now, see, what is so special about this is you don't trust somebody with that type of information that you can't trust. And some of you were here, as I'm saying this, you know people that you can trust, and you know people that you can't. And when you confide in someone, you don't just confide in anybody. If you were given information that you needed to keep or you needed to relay when you walked out of here and they, whoever said it to you, if they said, I need you to tell this, this is very, very important information. You're not just going to tell anybody. You're not just going to trust anybody with that information. You're going to go to somebody you confide in. And see, confiding doesn't always mean that it's a secret. We think of, well, I've confided in Clayton, or I've confided in Pastor Brett, or I've confided in Sister Shirley, whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's a secret. It means that you are giving them information that you trust them with and to carry out the information. What is so amazing about this story is Jesus chose a woman to be the first one to tell of his resurrection. Do you, man, how powerful is that? In a society that deems women less than men, in a society that looks down upon women, Jesus chose a woman to be the first one. He said, go and tell what you saw. Can you imagine that? I'm literally standing up here shaking because I'm kind of nervous telling this and I'm excited about it. Can you imagine Mary, though, running back and she runs back and she looks at him and she says, I have seen the face of the Lord. So point four, and remember this, Jesus confided in women. Hey, everybody. Point number five, Jesus celebrated women. So not only did he celebrate women, but he's still celebrating women, right? Amen? So I want to tell you all about a story real quick. It was a time where Jesus went to a home. Uh, the person who owned the home, was his name was Simon. And they were sitting, sitting there, and a woman was present. And as Jesus was seated, it says that she took this alabaster jar full of fragrant oil or perfume and she poured it over Jesus's head and it's believed that this fragrant oil was worth about a year's wages so median income in this area is about 40,000 a year so imagine someone taking a $40,000 jar of perfume and pouring it over someone pretty radical right and so as she did this it says that the disciples were indignant 
saying, what a waste. What a waste. And then Jesus said, why are you troubling the woman? For she has done a good work for me. She did this preparing me for my burial. And so as I was thinking about this, I thought, man, how amazing was this woman to, to understand who Jesus was, first of all, that he was the Messiah, the Christ, but to realize that he was going to the cross, that he was going to be buried and risen. Because what, what amazes me about this is his own disciples still hadn't grasped it, no matter how many times he told them, this is, what I've, this is why I've come, and this is what I'm doing, and this is where I'm going. They still had not grasped it yet. But not only did she grasp it, did she hear it and understand it, but she had already started taking steps and actions preparing for his burial. She was one of the few people who actually played a ministry to Jesus' main purpose on earth. I mean, imagine how cool that was. Like, he's on the cross, and he still smells this fragrant perfume. She was one of the only people to play that, that big of a, of a part in his death, burial, and resurrection. And he, what he said was, why are you troubling her? For she has done a great or a good work for me. And so I just want to say right now, ladies, I, I believe that, that Jesus is still saying that today. Thank you for the good work that you've done for me. I know that there's many times where, where sometimes it's, it's only a grandmother or it's only a wife who's standing in the gap for us crazy boys. And so how thankful we can be, men, to, to know that we had a praying mother, a praying grandmother, somebody standing in a gap for us. So, ladies, Jesus celebrated women, and he's celebrating you today. Thank you, ladies. So let's, uh, let's run back through them just for a second. Number one, Jesus empowered women. Number two, Jesus taught women. Are you teachable, men? Number three, Jesus honored women. Number four, Jesus confided in women. And number five, and I left it over there on the sheet over there. Now it's covered up right here. Jesus celebrated women. And so before we go to number six, why are we saying that? Because when Jesus came, he changed everything. Notice, I, I didn't tell any of them to bring up that women weren't recognized as equals back then. They weren't. But Jesus changes everything. Amen. You see, when he came, he recognized, hey, there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's not God. It's the devil. That was unheard of. Nobody talked about that in the Old Testament like Jesus did. He said, I've come to give life in that more abundantly. Not everything that comes down the road is from me. There's an enemy. Right. Recognize the enemy. Fight that enemy. It's the enemy. It's the devil. And so Jesus comes and turns, and this, is, uh, this one, number six right here, is pretty strong. And it puts a lot of things to, to, uh, uh, to, to bed or to rest, like forget about all that, is number six, Jesus respected women. And so we're going to read the scripture in Galatians 3 and uh, verse 26 through 29. It says, for you are all sons. And when the Bible talks about sons, it's talking about sonship. It's talking about family. It's talking about daughters too. Talking about ladies, okay? And so uh, we're all sons of God through faith in Christ. Jesus. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. That means, you know what? There, Cody brought up the prejudice between uh, uh, the woman at the well, the Jews, and, and the Samaritans. There was prejudice today. There's prejudice then. There were drugs then. Everything we deal with today, there's nothing new under the sun. They're trying to make it new to stir stuff up. It's nothing new. And they had prejudice then, and Jesus dealt with it. He was not prejudiced. He treated that woman equal. And no, right here, there's no difference between Jew and Greek because the Jews were supposed to be sharing the, God, the good news of God, and they were like, we're better than them. We're better than them. And Jesus started changing their thinking. Look at what the next part says. It says, uh, 
neither slave nor free. There were slaves then, and they're slaves today. How I many you know some people are slaves to credit cards? Don't be, don't be thinking that they're servants to something. You can be servant to uh, the credit master. Come on now. You know, that's a different sermon for a different time. There's slavery today. There was slavery then. And Jesus talked about then. He goes, there's neither male nor female. No, so, so that means, listen, I know some men in here are strong, and you can carry all kinds. Of, Cody talked about women carrying water. You can chop more wood than any woman, but I can stand up some women in here that carry some stuff spiritually that you can't even handle. Come on. The church wouldn't be the church without women. Amen. Look at all, how many men are back there teaching Sunday school. Ah. <laughs> huh? We trust the ladies to teach the Word of God to our children. And there's nothing wrong with men teaching. And, and Jeff goes back there, and I've done it too. But, but men, we need to step up. But women are carrying the, the load spiritually. In the households, I know I'm getting on my toes too. But hey. We got to step up and be the men God's called us to be. Ladies have carried it, and ladies are powerful spiritually. Think about your mama. You know, I, I was riding with my boss, and he's a Christian man, and his aunt just passed away. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes, and he goes, who's going to pray for us? My aunt prayed for my family and me every day. She prayed for my brothers and sisters. She prayed for my mama, my daddy. Who's going to pray for us? I said, I guess you got to. See, there's many a grandmother that's praying for their family and many a mother that's praying for their family. And so there's no difference between male and female. Everybody can hear from God. Everybody can hear from God. Everybody can receive from God. And everybody can walk with God. For all of you are one in Christ. In verse 29, for if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So ladies, don't be intimidated. Don't think less of yourselves or be ashamed of who you are in Christ Jesus. God has given you the same abilities as a man or anybody else to touch and hear the voice of God, to touch the heart of God, to hear the voice of God, to stand in the gap. The Bible calls it, uh, we can intercede, we can bring our petitions. Prayers of the righteous are heard. Didn't say male or female. Didn't say preacher. It said believer. Believer. We're believers. And so I want to encourage you that, that Jesus respected women. Isn't that a great scripture? Come on, Pastor Jeff's going to do bring number seven. All right. So Pastor Brett and Cody pretty much have talked about everything I planned on talking about so, right here. So, so we're just going to hit on some of that again. But uh, number seven is that Jesus valued women. Uh, so in Luke 13, um, Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath day in a synagogue. And there's a woman there who has an infirmity um, that has basically resulted in her being bent over for 18 years. So she hasn't been able to, like, stand up and straighten up for 18 years. And it says that Jesus sees her. And I love this because it doesn't say the woman approached him looking for healing. He's looking at the crowd, and he sees her, and he says, okay, come over here. I, I want to take care of that. I want to do something about that. So as, as he brings her over, he lays an, hands on her, and it says that she was immediately healed. So this is, you know, this is an awesome day for her. She's been bent over for 18 years. Just imagine how good that first stretch must have felt. You know, I'm someone that when I wake up in the morning, I never know what position I'm going to be in. I could be twisted all over the place because apparently I fight things when I sleep. I don't know. Uh, but sometimes that first stretch in the morning, like, man, I needed that bad. And this lady had been bent over for 18 years. And you would think that everybody would be happy because this is an amazing miracle that has happened in this lady's life. Um, but the ruler of the synagogue, actually tries to correct Jesus. He says, now, Jesus, you, had, you have six days in the week other than the Sabbath. You could have done this. What are you doing doing something like that, working by giving this lady healing on the Sabbath day? He's trying to correct her. And Jesus is, is a more compassionate person than I probably am because my reaction would have been, well, you had 18 years to take care of this, and here she still is, so why haven't you done something, you know? But Jesus doesn't do that. Um, he, he responds in a way that's a little more corrective and kind of helps get the point across. Um, but in, in, in Luke 13 and verse 15, this is God, the, Jesus replying to him. He says, the Lord replied, you hypocrites, don't you care for your own animals on the Sabbath, untying your ox or donkey from the stall and leading the way to water? He says, if you do this for your animals, what's wrong with allowing this beloved daughter of Abraham, notice that, that's important, this beloved daughter of Abraham 
who's been bound by Satan for 18 long years to be untied and set free on a Sabbath day. I love that. I love how the Passion says that. And it says, when they heard this, his critics were completely humiliated. And it says, but the crowd shouted with joy over the glorious things Jesus was doing among them. Now, when I first read this in, in the context of Jesus valuing women, I was like, well, you know, Jesus healed her, and, and, and that's pretty awesome. That shows he values you. Um, but there has to be more to it than that. And when I read this last night in the Passion Translation, right beside that little phrase, daughter of Abraham, it had a little footnote right there. So I clicked on the footnote, and this is what the footnote said. I'm just going to read this word for word. It says, the Jews spoke frequently about the sons of Abraham or an individual being a son of Abraham. But Jesus was the first to use this phrase, daughter of Abraham, giving women equal value. That's the footnote that it said in the the Passion Translation when you read that scripture right there. So Jesus valued women enough that not only did he provide healing for, but in front of that entire synagogue full of people, he was declaring to them that, hey, this woman and women in general have equal value to the men that are standing in here too. And that was a revolutionary thing for them back then. They had never heard that before, and he was declaring that to all of them. So if you look throughout church history, and if you look throughout our history or look around this church right here, you can see that God anoints and empowers women in some pretty amazing ways. And that's all part of how much he values them. So if any person or any minister has ever made you feel less or limited because of the fact you're a woman, I just want you to know God doesn't see you that way. Man, he sees you as just as valuable as any other person. So take that to heart and encourage you. So I don't know who has number eight, but I'm going to turn it over. All right. So number eight, last but not least, because there are many others. You know, uh, we could talk about Aquila and Priscilla, uh, the uh, husband and wife. Uh, We're not talking about them today, but she was the preacher. Most Bible scholars believe she was the anointed preacher in the bunch. And she brought Apollos up and taught him the word, and he became a great evangelist. Uh, In Acts, it talks about Philip had four daughters who prophesied that God used them. Come on. God used women. And so Philip's daughters were used. uh, And then Jesus sent these, most of these ladies off, and they began to witness and tell about what God done. So number eight, Jesus protected women. This is the story of the woman who was caught in the middle of adultery. We did a lesson on this or a sermon on this a couple of weeks back, and they drug her and threw her in, on the ground and in the temple. And, you know, and I always made fun. They had stones in the temple just in case you got out of line. I've been wanting to put some across here and, uh, in case somebody gets out of line. We can stone them, huh? No. Grace and mercy is what Jesus taught for her. And Jesus taught grace and mercy for her. Uh, he, he, he protected her. You know, they accused her. They started the thing. And, you know, J- Jesus wrote on the ground. What did he write on the ground? He probably wrote sins of everybody that was there accusing her. Because he said, all right, you without sin cast the first stone. You know, if he'd just say, no, we're not going to stone her, they would have, that was against the law of Moses. But he's teaching grace and mercy. And he protected this woman from being stoned. And I know what some of y'all are thinking, boy, if they started stoning me, I'd fake it like I was dead. And then when they drug me off, I'd jump up and run. But no, sir, they finished you off. It was horrible. And so Jesus, he shows grace and mercy. He protected this woman, and he protects people today. He wants to protect you today, men and women. And so I, I want to uh, finish this out uh, by saying that women today and every day, I hope you know, that you're empowered, that you're honored, that you're celebrated, and that you're valued. (coughs) Empowered, honored, celebrated, respected, and valued. Now, ladies, you got to be able to receive that. A lot of you can't see yourself that way. But that's the lie of the enemy. Remember, I talked about the enemy. He devalues you. He tells you you're not empowered. He wants to take away your abilities. He wants to make you cower down. But don't. You don't have to be rude and mean. You're going to walk in love, but you're empowered to walk in love. And you can share the love of God. You're empowered. And you can receive the honor that God wants to bestow upon you. Be honored today, mothers. Be honored today, ladies. Here at Legacy Church, we want to honor you. Because all women need to be honored. They need to be respected and valued. Men, honor your wives. Honor your daughters. Celebrate them. Respect them. Value them. Teach them their value. 
If you don't, somebody on smooth talking knuckleheads going to come by, hey, mama, what's up? That was back in the 70s, but they'll go, whatever they say today, they'll say it. They will. But you better be valuing your daughter, and you better be honoring them and teaching them what honor is. And ladies, we want to say we respect you, so I, I want to just bow your heads today. I want you to, we're going to pray. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to everybody, just like this woman who was caught. There is nothing that, that you have not done or done that God has not seen. You can't hide from God, and he's not out to get you. He's out, yeah, he's out to get you saved. He's out to get you in the family. He's out to get you to come and be a part of his life, of his family, of, of what he's doing in the earth. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you're here today and you want to accept him, will you just raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor. I want to accept Jesus. I believe this whole service was about for somebody to you know, rededicate their life to God, give their life to God for the first time. If that's you, you've never given your heart to Jesus, will you raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor? How about you're here and you know what? I, I, I've drifted away. I need to come back. Will you lift your hand and let me pray over you? Nobody's looking, just me. I'm just going to pray over the people that lift their hand. Anybody? I know the Lord's dealing with some. Well, let's just pray this prayer together. Well, y'all, let's all pray. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me, for all my sins. Please forgive me. Take me back. I receive you as my Savior again. Help me live for you for the rest of my life. Holy Spirit, stir in my heart. Teach me the ways of the Father. Teach me the ways of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.